had been talking about how the uh, art in Northern Europe during the 16th century uh, continued the deep interest in detailed particulars that we saw beginning with Jan Van Eyck, uh, that in fact there was a con continuity of that almost microscopic interest in details. And with this uh, art fix, we'll be looking at Hieronymus Bosch, working in the early 16th century in the Low Countries in Flanders, where Van Eyck was from. Uh, but unlike Van Eyck, uh, where details enhance the sense of realism, what we see with Bosch is that the details are used to create a supernatural world, a very strange place. In fact, it's so strange, his pictures are, that they were immediately incredibly popular. We have evidence of people making fake Bosch paintings almost immediately, even during his own lifetime. And there are copies of many of his compositions in prints and woodcuts and engravings, also beginning during his lifetime. And beyond that, as we look later in the 16th century, we find numerous artists, particularly in the, in the low countries, who were very much influenced by Bosch. All of this shows how popular he was and how big a market there was for these strange and wonderful works like the Garden of Earthly Delights. Now, the center panel, which we see here on the right, uh, is almost entirely populated by nude figures. And these figures seem to be reveling uh, in sort of wanton behavior. If we look at details of the Gental, of the uh, Garden of Earthly Delights, we find numerous uh, images of figures seeming to enjoy themselves in a rather happy-go-lucky manner. This figure uh, reclining back as he rides uh, that strange cat with a unicorn's horns, uh, for example, or uh, on the opposite side of the pond, these figures that are uh, performing somewhat acrobatic circus-like feats on the back of various kinds of animals, from an albino horse to a jackass through uh, a camel. At the same time, this begins to give us a sense of, of maybe some deeper meaning here, because you'll notice that while that one figure uh, rides a horse on a single foot, looks back at his own genitalia, you'll see that his, his anus is being violated by a bird's beak, which suggests that this is not necessarily all fun and games. That said, the majority of the figures that we see, the nudes that dance around in the center of the Garden of Earthly Delights and even in the foreground, seem fairly carefree. Um, I want to look at the figures in the pool, sort of dead center in the panel, and you can see as we look at them that there's a sort of a, a happy playfulness to the figures, two figures, uh, I don't know, performing uh, some sort of aquatic ballet uh, in the foreground, but a lot of sort of innocent uh, flipping about between the different figures. When I say innocent, I should say seemingly innocent, because we'll find that there's something much more to it than that. Um, there's also quite a bit of humor here. We have a couple in a, in a muscle shell that apparently are copulating. You'll notice the man's legs coming out and the woman's legs on top of him. But as they do this, he appears to be either farting or defecating uh, pearls out of his, out of his ass. Um, and so uh, there's a certain humor to all of this as well. And this seeming lack of judgment on Bosch's part toward all of the naked frolicking we see in the central panel has complicated uh, many people's understanding of the work itself. And there has been some suggestion that perhaps Bosch was a, a heretic and, and reveling in this. But we'll find that that's not actually the case, because we have to remember that the central panel is part of a triptych. Remember the term triptych means three wings, so the two outside panels fold over the central panel, three wings there. And this format, the triptych format, is usually reserved for works of art that are used in prayer, like, for example, the Marod piece by Robert Canton that we talked about in another screencast. Our work, uh, The Garden of the Lights, was obviously not used for prayer. It's simply inappropriate in its subject matter for something like that. And one wonders if Bosch's use of the triptych format is, in fact, part of its humor uh, that we see in some of the details as well. 
Furthermore, uh, Boston's triptych is huge. It's, uh, the central panel is about seven feet on a side. So that means it's a good nine times as tall or as big as, as the campan central panel. Uh, and that suggests uh, a very large viewing space. Uh, it suggests wealth on the part of the original owner. Uh, the fact that it focuses on nudity and lust, uh, coupling, um, some people have suggested that maybe it was made as a sort of playful decoration for a wedding, which is uh, altogether possible. Uh, we know that shortly after Bosch's death, it was owned by the Duke of Nassau, Duke Henry III of Nassau, that's part of the northern part of the Low Countries. Uh, he's documented as owning this work, and in fact, there was a wedding in his household around the time that this was painted. So that's a distinct possibility that it's a sort of playful uh, wedding decoration, although there's no proof for it, uh, at least beyond a shadow of a doubt. If we go back to considering the subject matter within the context of this triptych, we need to look at the right-hand panel to set up what's going on in the center, because you'll notice that the landscape is unbroken across the two of these. The left panel shows us the Garden of Eden. Uh, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, this is before mankind has sinned. This is just after Eve has been created. Front and center, we see God looking very much like Christ, looking very much like the figure from the Gent altar piece, perhaps. Without his crown, we'll see lots of references to that word here. He holds Eve by the wrist, about to bless her with his other hand. Adam sits waiting for what happens next. Um, this is uh, God presenting Eve to Adam. Uh, this is sometimes referred to as the marriage of Adam and Eve, and that means this is before the apple has been picked, before the apple has been eaten, before the fall of man has happened. They are both still sinless in Eden, as is obvious from their nakedness. Adam sits immediately Jason to what we presume to be the tree of knowledge. Uh, directly behind him there are some birds in it. However, Satan is not there yet. In fact, if we look hard enough, we find Satan on the right-hand side of the panel, uh, the serpent wrapped around a different tree, as if he's trying to figure out where he needs to go in order to uh, bring about the downfall of man. One of the things that's fascinating about Bosch's conception of Eden is that even though the fall of man hasn't happened yet, it seems as if there are signs of discord everywhere. For example, directly below Adam's hand is a cat walking away with what appears to be perhaps a mouse in its mouth. Uh, these are enemies, uh, and uh, there is, in fact, discord in the world. We saw this same metaphor when we looked at this print by Albrecht Dürer, The Fall of Man, briefly before this uh, work. Chronologically speaking, remember that prints can be widely circulated, and there's every chance that Bosch knew this print. And there we see below Adam's right, or his right foot on your left, is a mouse being trapped by Adam's foot, a cat immediately next to it, and for Durer, he was using this as a, a metaphor, as a symbol for the fact that the fall of man hadn't happened yet, and discord had yet to come into the world. As further proof that uh, Bosch may have known this print by Durer, you'll notice that, remember, that Durer has directly behind Eve's ankles a very prominent bunny rabbit. Um, in fact, uh, Bosch includes this same detail. There's a bunny directly behind her. Uh, again, looking away from us, another one there by the edge of that hill, uh, nibbling away at the grass. These seem to suggest that he knew Durer. But for Bosch, they're also uh, symbolic. Rabbits are often used in those as artists' symbols of lust because of the prodigious way that they breed. And they're placed here directly behind Eve as a symbol of the lust that she will use to cause Adam to fall. Elsewhere in the Garden of Eden, we find various images of animals in discord. I uh, hear a small frog-like reptile being torn apart um, by two birds. Strange animals in the background, this serpent-like dragon breathing fire, but immediately next to it, a lion eating a, a deer. 
uh, again, symbols that perhaps discord is already here, even though the fall of man hasn't happened yet. Other strange creatures abound everywhere we look. There are oddities, uh, mutations here in nature. This three-headed bird, for example, directly beneath uh, the feet of God. Or in the background on the right, we see a three-headed reptile crawling out of the muck and onto the earth as a no number of figures begin to move in that direction out of that pond in the middle. Um, or other odd hybrid creatures, or even just exotic uh, albino giraffe, and that little two-legged hound dog-like creature with the long ears. Uh, so again, here, even before the fall, Eden is a very, very strange place. Uh, and that suggests to us then that, uh, for Bosch, there's something else going on here. Um, and then again, if we look at the fountain in the dead center of the pond behind God, uh, as he presents Eve to Adam, uh, you'll notice that this, this, uh, strange fountain spurts water into the lake. There are jewels uh, on the island where it rests. And again, this makes us wonder if he also knew Van Eyck's uh, Gant Altar piece, where a prominent fountain with jewels around it sits in front of the altar with Christ. Um, it's almost as if it's a playful uh, uh, redux of that work. And then finally, if you look in the center of that fountain that's painted by Bosch, we see that there's in fact an owl. This again gives us a clue to the overall theme. Owls, because they live in darkness, are uh, symbols of evil. And so evil is here waiting, maybe even already present, well before uh, the fall of man. Now we will come back to the center panel and talk about how this all affects our understanding of it.